Good morning. We're going to get ready to open up our Bible study with our uh, passage of Scripture, one of my favorites, Psalm 51, 51st Psalm, verse 1 through 13. Then we're going to have our invitation. Psalm 51, in the language of the King James Version, sounds like this. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. According unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shaken in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Verse 6. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Verse 12. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then I will teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted to thee. Amen. The word of God for the people of God. The 51st Psalm, verses 1 through 13. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for allowing us this opportunity to come together. We ask you to invoke your blessings upon us as we share in this study on today. Be with those who have logged in to be with us on today. Be with those who have desired to be with us and cannot. Continue to give us all the strength that we need for the task that lies ahead in all of our lives. It is in Jesus' name we pray and give thanks. Amen. Amen. Okay, well, we're glad to be here on today. Glad to have you with us on today. I want to give honor and respect to our pastor emeritus, Dr. Joseph E. Felker, Jr., and Sister Shirley Felker. We hope and pray that you all are doing well as well as to all of the officers and the members of the Mount Carmel Missionary Baptist Church, and to our brown bag Bible study members. And you know, today I started to bring a brown bag, rather to use it as an object to show you, uh, because there may be a couple of you all don't know, know nothing about a brown bag uh, and lunch, uh, as we used to do it uh, some years ago. But nevertheless, we are grateful, and we're hoping that you have opportunities it's just before lunch, or lunchtime where you are, if it's Eastern time, that you have time to share that lunch as you're sharing that lunch, that you're also sharing this discussion of the word uh, that we share on today. Of course, we are also eternally grateful for our friends uh, and family of Mount Carmel that are sharing with us on this study as well. Now, we're continuing our study uh, <clears throat> in the book of Isaiah. We've made our way to chapter seven now, and uh, this is gonna be the sixth session uh, of Isaiah. And I do want you to know uh, that as we go into these studies, it becomes important for us to understand that I know a lot of us, a lot of people look at it as Isaiah as an exciting book uh, for a number of different reasons. Uh, one of the reasons is because of some of the very, very catchy passages of Scripture that are there. Uh, and there are, there, are the, there are many of them throughout the book. But uh, in our study, what we want to do is actually catch the whole theme of why God even inspired Isaiah to do what he did, and how that connection has a lot to do with even where we are on today. And so in today's session, uh, we're going to be talking about bad decisions, bad decisions. And we're going to be uh, dealing with uh, Isaiah again, the entire chapter of Isaiah, Lord said the saying today. It's 25 verses. We're going to be using the New American Standard Bible uh, on today. It's the closest translation, actually to the original text translation from uh, the Hebrew. And so we're going to be using uh, that as our passage of scripture to share with on today. Uh, Bad Decisions, Session 6. Now, in our previous lessons, we were introduced to Isaiah the prophet. And you remember when I talk about prophets, I, I like to make mention of the fact that prophets not only are foretellers, but they are forth tellers. They are foretellers, F-O-R-E, tellers, in that they tell what's going to happen in the future. But prophets, like Isaiah particularly and specifically, are also forth tellers. And they say, what thus saith the Lord. And so we have some forth telling and we have some foretelling uh, in our lessons on today and throughout the book of Isaiah. Now, 
as we discussed, Isaiah was a man called by God who ministered uh, to both the kings and the common people of Judah, which was the southern kingdom. And he did that for some time. He did it for decades, actually. Now, the first five chapters of Isaiah's uh, book focus on the consequences of Judah's social sins. And, you know, we talked about those over some of our last sessions. We talked about the social sins, and particularly the empty ritualism and of their religious observances. You know, uh, they would close their eyes when they were supposed to be praying, but they really wasn't praying to God sincerely. Uh, they would go to the temple, but they really weren't worshiping God in sincerity and in truth. And so not only were their lives and activities and actions empty as it relates to a relationship with God, we find <clears throat> that uh, their uh, actions and activities with each other was as well. And this is something that it becomes important for us to understand that God want, God takes quite seriously. If you consider yourself a child of God, if, you consider, if one considers themselves a nation that is founded on the principles of God, then it becomes important for us to do things the way God would have us to do them. When we look at this book of Isaiah, we see a very, very uh, interesting parallel to another nation that calls himself a nation under God. As a matter of fact, it is this country, the United States of America, in our Pledge of Allegiance, we say one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. That's what we purport when we say the Pledge of Allegiance. On the back of our money, we have in God we trust. And think about it, brothers and sisters, God is watching us as a nation as we attempt to say that we are a godly nation, a Christian nation, as, we, as many would, of our conservative friends would like to say. Uh, but yet and still, we have all of this uh, racism and phobia that exists in this country. And then we have all of the insincere, wor insincere worship that exists in this country, this country that's supposed to be a nation founded on the principles of God. And so brothers and sisters, I invite you that as we look at Isaiah, we look at ourselves, we look at our country, and we look at the strange parallels and also the potential results, similar results, as what happened to uh, the kingdom of Israel, as what happened to the kingdom of Judah, can conceivably happen to the United States of America. So let's just be mindful of that reality. Mm -hmm. Now, in Isaiah chapter 6, the prophet recounted his original call, if you remember, uh, which both uh, devastated him as well as inspired him. Uh, remember, it opens with, in the year the king Uzziah died, I also saw the Lord. He was high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple, and he had this marvelous, this magnificent, this awe-inspiring vision, so much so that it made him realized that he wasn't even worthy to be in the presence of God, yet, let alone presence to speak on the behalf of God. But God, of course, let him know that he was his man and he was who he wanted to say what he needed to say. Now, the next section of Isaiah's prophecy begins with an imminent historical crisis. The king of Syria and the king of Israel, the northern kingdom now, had brought their armies to the outskirts of Jerusalem in the southern kingdom to make war against Judah. Hear me now, we're going to get back to this in a minute in more specifics. Uh, where we are at now in this particular lesson, the king of Syria, a godless nation, has joined forces with the king of Israel, the northern kingdom, a supposedly God-fearing, God-obeying, God-trusting, God-depending nation. They have come together to try to destroy the southern kingdom of Judah. And so it becomes important for us to understand that. Now, in addition to that, the nation of Assyria, because now, and that can be kind of tricky, because we talk about the nation of Syria and the nation of Assyria. Those are two different countries. It becomes important for us to understand that because they play a very important part in not only the life of the children of Israel, northern and southern kingdoms, but they also play a vital part in the punishment and the destruction of the northern and southern kingdoms. So now, in addition, the nation of Assyria had risen as a dangerous threat in the region. This was a time of fear for the people of Judah, especially those living in Jerusalem. In response to this, 
God sent Isaiah to reveal what was about to happen, specifically that the residents of Jerusalem would be spared destruction, at least for now, because it's really looking bad and it really looking like the end was near. And remember now, with this end being near, it's all because of the sins of the people in the first place. They wouldn't be in this position had they been doing the things the way God would have them to do. So now, Isaiah comes, as we go into chapter 7, and brings them some news. The news that he brings them, we're going to find is going to be some good news for the people of Judah. Furthermore, to encourage King Ahaz, the Lord is going to offer to send him a sign, a sign that he can choose. Whatever sign you want, let me know what it is. God is basically saying, and I'll give it to you. And uh, so you will know that this is me doing this with you. And this becomes very interesting because most of the times, prophets and individuals that God's going to use, they will ask God, can you give me a sign and let me know that you're with me? You know, can you make the fleece dry on the bottom and wet on the top or wet on the top or dry on the bottom or can you do something tremendously fantastic to let me know that you're with me but here with King Ahaz king of Judah God says to him you pick the sign and I will give it to you now what we're going to find out that uh, King Ahaz kind of uses what I like to call some uh, fake humility and uh, which is a bad decision he says no uh, I'm not going to try to get no sign from you, God. I, I don't want you to do that. And, uh, and, and here we have the beginnings of what I like to call a bad decision, to which God declares to him after he says that, that uh, God would choose his own sign. Hmm. And then we will later find out what that sign is going to be. Now, we will see in this that the sign that God is going to give him is going to represent God's plan of salvation for more than just the immediate threat facing Judah. As a matter of fact, uh, we're going to get into a passage of scripture that talks about Emmanuel, God with us, born of a virgin. That whole piece uh, comes out of this particular chapter, and that becomes God's sign that he's going to ultimately protect his people, protect and restore and save uh, his people. Uh, in fact, the sign that God would give would represent his ultimate plan of salvation for all of humanity. And remember now, all of this is happening during, in the Old Testament. All of this is happening before Jesus comes on the scene. Okay, so it becomes important for us to understand that. So now, let's take a look. I want to first of all uh, do a uh, kind of a lengthy reading for you right now. But I want to read Isaiah chapter 7, verses 1 through 9. And then I want to kind of go through those for you on today. Okay? Now, uh, beginning at verse 1. I'm going to read to verse 9. Now it came about in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, the king of Judah, that Rezin, king of Aram, and Pekah, the son of Ramalah, king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to wage war against it. But he could not conquer it. When it was reported to the house of David, saying, the Arameans have taken a stand by Ephraim, his heart and the hearts of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake from the wind. Verse 3. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out now, meet Ahaz, you and your son, Shir Jashub, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the road to the fullest field, and say to him, Take care and be calm, and have no fear, and do not be faint-hearted, because of these two stumps of smoldering logs on account of the fierce anger of Rezin and Aram and the son of Ramalia. Because Aram with Ephraim and the son of Ramalia has planned evil against you, saying, let's go up against Judah and terrorize it and take it for ourselves by assault and set up the son of Tabil as king in the midst of it. This is what the Lord God says. It shall not stand, nor shall it come to pass. For the head of Aram is Damascus. The head of Damascus is Rezin. Now another 65 years, Ephraim will be broken to pieces so that it is no longer a people. The head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is the son of Ramalia. If you will not believe, you certainly will not last. 
Now, there's a lot in there, but we're going to deal with those pieces. Now, what we have in uh, Isaiah chapter 7, beginning with verse 1 and going through verse 9, is what I like to call in verse 1, the first of bad decisions. Okay? Where it says, Now it came about in the days of Ahab, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Rezin, the king of Aram, which is another name for Syria, and Pekah, the son of Ramalia, king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but could not, I repeat, could not conquer it. Now look at this. Brothers against one another. Here we see the northern kingdom of Israel, consisting of ten of the twelve tribes, is joining forces with Syria, a godless nation, to invade, defeat, and destroy the southern kingdom of Judah, which is, consists of two of the twelve tribes. However, it did not work. Okay? And the reason why is because Judah, the southern kingdom, had made an allegiance with Assyria. Now, interestingly enough, uh, because Judah, the southern kingdom, had this allegiance with Assyria, they were strong enough to withstand the attacks of the other forces against them. Now, notice, I did not mention that anyone prayed. I did not mention that anyone went to God for guidance and protections. These were all bad decisions. Even though uh, the southern kingdom did not get defeated, uh, it wasn't because of any good decisions that they made, because even their decision to join with the country of Assyria was a bad decision. Okay, and so we're going to continue to look at, uh, there's more to come here. Let's look at verse 3. Shajashu, Shir Jashu, which is the name of one of uh, Isaiah's children. And what that name means is a remnant shall return. Let me read verse 3 for you. The Lord said to Isaiah, Go now and meet Ahab, you and your son, Shir Jashu, okay, at the end of the conduit at the fullest field, and then say what he says to him. But listen, the name of, and it becomes important for us to understand that, that the name of Isaiah's son that God has him take with him Shaz Jashu means a remnant shall return. So this child, the very existence of this child and the very name of this child is a message from God to the people. And that message is a remnant shall return. You see, the presence of Isaiah's son is an object lesson and a typology of God's faithfulness to the believers among the people. But now let's go down to verse 8. I'll read verse 8 for you. For the head of Aram is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is reason. Now, within another 65 years, Ephraim will be broken to pieces so that it is no longer a people. Listen, he says in his words, this passage, Ephraim will be broken. Now, this tribe, Ephraim, represents those 10 tribes that are part of the northern kingdom of Israel. God is letting them know. God is telling Isaiah to let the king of Judah know that Ephraim is going to be destroyed. They tried to destroy you. But listen, I'm only giving them another 65 years anyway, and I'm going to break them. You know, the prophet predicted the coming destruction because of their idolatry. And what are those? Bad decisions. It is unfortunate that all of the things that either of these kingdoms are doing amongst themselves with one another are the things that's going to cause them to lose the promised land. All bad decisions. So now, let's take a look at verse 9. Again, verse 9. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is the son of Ramalia. And if you will not believe, you certainly will not last. Listen, the choice belonged to King Ahaz now. God has told them, told him, that he's going to protect them, even though they made these bad decisions. But he said, listen, I'm going to destroy them, even though they may look invincible, because I'm God, and I'm bigger than anybody that would ever come up against you. But I want you to know something, King. If you don't believe, you won't be successful. Mm -hmm. And so he could trust the Lord's, he could trust the Lord's word, word, or he could fall into the enemy's hands, or even worse, uh, experience a final hardening to his heart and begin to depend on himself and not depend on God at all, which has been one of the big problems that the people have had uh, in this situation anyway. So now, 
Let's take a look at verses 10, 11, and 12. It becomes interesting. I'm going to read those for you, and then we're going to take a look at them carefully. Then the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask for a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Make it as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I put the Lord to test. Now listen, this is really ridiculous what Ahaz does at this point. God tells him, listen, I want you to know I'm with you. So you pick the sign. Whatever sign you want me to give, I'll give it to you. And then Ahaz tries to bring this false humility and say, I will not put the Lord to the test. The Lord didn't say put me to the test. The Lord is trying to help him and showing him that he's with him. And this becomes very, very important because these are people who have actually uh, been quite away from God for so long. They all deserve punishment, death, and destruction. They all deserve that. And going all the way back to Josiah, when they began to try to change things a little bit to get to this point where we are today, it becomes important that God is a merciful and long-suffering God where he says, well, because you guys are trying, because there are some people that want to do right, I'm going to give you a chance. And I'm going to show you that this is, not, this is no joke here. This is not Isaiah making this prophecy of himself. You name what the uh, sign is that you want. And God will give you that sign. And you know, this is, not, that's, this is not just some saying that Isaiah is saying to you. This is God, the creator of the universe, saying it to you. But yet and still, Ahaz says, now, nah, that's all right. I don't need a sign. And so, which leads us to, and that's another bad decision, by the way. Which leads us to verse 13. Let's look at verse 13. Then he said, listen now, house of David. Is it too trivial a thing for you to try the patience of men? that you will try the patience of my God as well. Now, listen. The prophet, upon hearing Ahaz's refusal, now broadens his audience beyond Ahaz to include the whole faithless house of David. You see, the entire nation, as I said a few minutes ago, was guilty of wearying God. Okay, God is constantly protecting them and they're constantly not praying to him, not thanking him, worshiping other gods, doing a, mistreating one another, doing all of this stuff, yet and still boldly going around calling themselves the chosen ones, the people of God, one nation under God. Probably said it was indivisible too. Okay, doing all of this stuff, but yet and still, uh, God was still keeping them, but it's getting time is running out. And so since the king represents his people, he speaks for his people. And if he speaks for his people, he also makes his people accountable, as well as responsible as he is. And they were. I mean, interestingly enough, God is giving Ahaz the opportunity to have protection from him and giving him that guarantee. And then he says, oh, I'm not going to try, waste the time of God doing that. And, and God literally says to him through Isaiah, you've been wasting the people's time. Why, what, what make you decide now that you won't waste God's time? Where is this false humility coming from? Amen. Bad decision. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, let's take a look at verse 14. Therefore, the Lord God himself will give you a sign. And here comes a passage that many of you all know in the King James Version. Behold, a virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and she will name him Emmanuel. Okay, now this becomes very, very important uh, for us to understand because now he says the Lord himself will give you a sign. Now, Ahaz refused to choose a sign, and so the Lord now states that he will send his own sign. And the implementation of this prophecy would not take place till long after Ahaz's lifetime. Even though God gives him a sign, he gives him a sign. And remember now we're talking about F-O-R-E now, foretelling. And now the sign is, you're going to get a sign, but you're not going to live to see this sign because it's going to be my sign, okay? A sign from God. The Lord offers to provide a sign of Ahab's own choosing to show that his word is true. But when Ahab refuses, God declared he will send his own sign. And what is that sign? The fulfillment of which would not take place until the birth of Jesus, the promised Messiah. Amen. Amen. Emmanuel means God with us. Mm -hmm. Okay, it becomes important for us to understand that. And that becomes very interesting because, to be perfectly honest with you, <clears throat> God has been with them all the time. Okay? But nevertheless, <coughs> they, uh, they were not, uh, uh, how can I say, respectful enough to uh, 
uh, do right with God being with them, protecting them. And so ultimately, God's going to send his son, Jesus, born of a virgin, Emmanuel, God with us, in order to restore his people. Which lets us know that God being a God that, that, that is omniscient, that knows all, that knows not only the past, the present, but also knows the future. He knows that they're going to still need restoring. Even though it's going to be many, 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 many years later when Jesus comes on the scene in a human form, they're still going to need restoring. Now, but now, but, but right here is where the prophecy gets complicated. You know, and that's one of the interesting things about Isaiah because he goes in and out of what's happening with him. Uh, that is a message to the people as well as what God is going to do uh, in the future as well. Uh, so it becomes kind of complicated. So we see verse 15. He will eat courage and honey at the time he knows enough to refuse evil and choose good. Now, this courage and honey is basically uh, courage, of course, are the results of coagulated milk or spoiled milk or milk that is getting to the point of becoming like cheese, particularly cottage cheese, okay? It's no longer drinking milk anymore. And the, the, the diet indicated the scarcity of the provisions that's going to characterize how, thing, how bad things are going to get for them. Because right now they're eating up the fat of the land. I mean, things are going great. I mean, yeah, they're having wars, but economically they're doing fine. Socially, they think they're doing even finer. Okay, they think that all things are well. They just got to try to keep people from coming through their gates and, and trying to change their ways. And even with that, they seem to be having a pretty good control as it relates to that. But Isaiah's letting them know that, listen, things are going to get bad for you. And, you know, you're not going to be able to eat the way you think. But now, not only does the courage and the honey uh, refer to the meals or the scarcity of the foods that the people are going to eat when that time of, pen, of punishment comes, but it also means, as it relates to Jesus, that he would come from a family of humble means. You know, Jesus would not be born uh, in a stadium potatoes family either. Mm. Okay, uh, you know, he's going to be born in a manger. Amen. Okay, and so it becomes important for us to understand that. And those kind of things start crossing into each other. And it becomes important uh, as we look at the uh, prophecy of Isaiah here. So now, let's take a look at verse 16. Verse 16 says these words. For before the boy knows enough to refuse evil and choose good, the land whose two kings you dread will be abandoned. Now, interestingly enough, now we are flipping back. and We go, go now back to the life of the son promised to Isaiah by God. Because remember now, if you've been reading, uh, even after we've taught some of these lessons, reading some of the background passages that we've covered in verses 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, you'll find or remember that God has promised Isaiah that he would have children. And his children, and then he gave him the names that he was going to give those children. Uh, we mentioned the name of the first one, which was Shashir Jeshu. We know about that, and we know what his name means. But he also uh, has another son that's going to be born. And the promise is that before the promised son of, of Isaiah was old enough to make moral choices, the kings of Syria and Ephraim were to meet their doom at the hands of the Assyrian. So the child that Isaiah is going to be given by God, before that child gets old enough to make any kind of decisions of his own, God is letting them know that, hey, the kings of Syria and the kings of Israel will meet their destruction. They will be utterly destroyed. They'll be murdered, killed at the hands of the Assyrians. And so as you can see, bad decisions lead to bad consequences. Now, let's look at verse 17. The Lord will bring on you your people and your father's house such days as have not come since the days that Ephraim separated from Judah, the days of the king of Assyria. Listen, not only did the Lord use the Assyrians to judge the northern kingdom, but he also used that nation to invade Ahaz's dominion of Judah. You see, the coming of the Assyrian king was the beginning of the end for the nation. Ultimately, and it's so an and unfortunate reality, the bad decision that the southern kingdom of Judah would make is that they thought that Assyrians were their friends. 
And so they would, they would team up with the Assyrians to try to get protection from their enemies, who was their brothers and sisters in the north, Israel, and also the kingdom of Syria. But yet and still, we come to find out that the kingdom of Assyria wanted it all. They wanted to destroy them all. And so again, we're seeing this leading to the consequences of bad decisions. And that's why God says, as Isaiah say in verse 17, the Lord will bring on you, your people, and your father's house such days as has not come since that day Ephraim separated from Judah. And I just want you to know, for those of you that are Sunday school readers and Bible studiers, when, when the two kingdoms divided from one another, way back at that time, now, it was a big war, it was a big fight, and a lot of people died, there was a lot of death and destruction. And they said, you haven't seen nothing like this since then, what's getting ready to happen to you now. Why? Because of, again, bad decisions. Now, let's take a look at verses 18 through 25 to take us out on this particular lesson. On that day, the Lord will whistle for the fly that is in the remotest part of the canals of Egypt, and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria. They will all come and settle on the steep ravines, on the lodges in the cliffs, and all the thorn bushes and all the watering places. On that, law, on that day, verse 20, the Lord will shave with a razor, hired from the regions beyond the Euphrates River, that is the king of Assyria, the head and the hair of the legs, and it will also remove the beard. That's a very humiliating thing to happen in that particular culture. Now, on that day, a person may keep alive only a heifer and a pair of sheep. And because of the abundance of milk produced, he will eat courage. For everyone who is left within the land will eat courage and honey. And it will come about on that day that every place where there used to be a thousand vines, valued at a thousand shekels of silver, will become briars and thorns. People will come here with bows and arrows, because all the land will be briars and thorns. Verse 25, as for all the hills which used to be cultivated with the plow, you will not go there for the fear of the briars and the thorns, but they will become a place for pasturing oxen and for sheep to trample. It's going to be bad, you all. Okay, he says in these verses, the desolation in 18, verses 18 through 25, the desolation that is prophesied in this section begins in the days of Ahaz and will reach its climax ultimately when the Babylonians will come in and ultimately carry them all away. Okay? Its results continue. Now, the results of these bad decisions will continue to the time when the Messiah will return and deliver Israel and establish his kingdom on earth. Now, when he talks about the flies and the bees, the flies of Egypt and the bees of Assyria become important, Egypt was full of flies and Assyria was noted for beekeeping. And these insects basically were symbols of the armies of the powerful countries that the Lord would summon to overrun Judah and take the people into exile. God has always taken uh, the enemies of his people and used them against his own people when they have disobeyed him. Matter of fact, in the scriptures, God calls Assyria the rod of my anger. Okay? God will, God will raise up. I like the way Martin Luther King used to say it when he says, He'll raise up a nation that don't even know my name to punish us. Okay? And so it becomes important for us. And again, why? All because of bad decisions. Now, we're hoping that uh, today's lesson has been a blessing and a help to you on today. As we prepare to wrap up uh, on today, uh, we thank you again for sharing with us. Uh, and again, today is day 36 of our 40 days of restoration. Uh, we hope you've been praying. We hope you've been reading the scriptures. Uh, we hope you've been fasting. Uh, we hope you've been reflecting. And we hope you've been coming uh, restored, not only with uh, your relationship with God, but with your brothers and your sisters. And we want you all also to know that as we prepare for communion here uh, at Mount Carmel, that communion is available for those that want to come and pick it up uh, today. You can come and pick it up today if you would like. Uh, it is available. We'll have it available here through Saturday uh, for you to come and pick up. Uh, we also want you to know that we're going to be broadcasting a replay of a previous uh, Good Friday service that we hosted here at Mount Carmel on Friday noon. It's going to be on the Facebook platform as well as on the uh, YouTube platform. And uh, be looking for that uh, because we'll be posting notifications uh, as it relates to that. Uh, and also, we're looking forward to having an opportunity, as we shared on Sunday, uh, to come upstairs 
uh, and have worship upstairs. Uh, we'll be following all of the protocols as it relates to uh, being safe and doing all of the social distancing that we need to do. And so we ask that you again go to our social, go to our website as well as to our uh, Facebook page, and you can see that we have posted there uh, our protocols for entrance and worship uh, on this coming Sunday. So uh, thanks, Sister Jones, for being our camera person and really uh, taking care of things today. Say good morning, Sister Jones. Good morning, everybody. And so until uh, next time, on Saturdays, the Lord say the same for our Sunday School Preview Review. Take care and God bless.